This is going to be a little bit different today. You'll probably notice that uh, it already looks a little different from our camera angle. Um, and you may not have got everything you've seen before on our live stream. Uh, today is the day after Chase's and Crystal's wedding. So Chase, Kamala, Crystal Wemmer were married, uh, married last night. And a great ceremony, awesome celebration. Uh, we wish them the absolute best, and now they're on their honeymoon. So our tech guy is gone, and uh, we had some of the tech equipment there at the wedding. And then Alistair, uh, our associate pastor, was going to bring it here and take care of that. But he and Remy, uh, his wife, are actually um, at the hospital right now and about to have a baby. So he's gone too. So I jerry-rigged some stuff this morning, and I'm going to try to get this on the uh, the live stream as, as good as I can. and. Uh, uh, it probably is not what you uh, were expecting today, but uh, we're still going to get the word and go through it today, so I'm excited about that. Um, as far as announcements, uh, I, 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 same stuff's going on. You have uh, Operation Christmas Child, uh, still is an opportunity for you to, to get involved and to help send the gospel and gifts to children and families uh, in countries worldwide. Uh, you participate with that by packing a box or by, um, uh, you can donate items to be packed in a box or you can donate money and we will go out with our teams and buy the things and ship them overseas for you. So those are the ways you can do that. There are no fancy little slides on the screen, uh, but you know how to get to our website probably by now and uh, you can give there. Uh, you certainly can give of your tithes and offering the way you have been uh, already and we appreciate that. So um, that's really what's going on. I wanted to really announce uh, Chase and Crystal and, and then Alistair and Remy and just uh, fun things going on there in their lives. Uh, please be in, in prayer for them uh, both. Uh, but we're going to get into the Word today. We are getting back on track in our gospel series we started last year called Written So That You Might Believe. And, uh, and that's a verse in Scripture in John 20 and uh, verse 31. It says, But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life in His name. Now you've heard that probably said or uh, read many times before. Uh, last year we started this series. Maybe you're new to the series now. You can catch up with that on our online content. But we're, we're picking up now after Jesus' uh, boyhood, and we, we ended last year uh, when Jesus was in the temple and uh, about his father's business, and he, he kind of got lost, right? His family left without him, and they came back. So we talked about that, and then he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. And then, we, then Jesus kind of disappears off the scene. We just know he's in Nazareth. He's growing up. He's, uh, he's taken over at some point for Joseph, his father, um, and uh, in carpentry. So he's doing that in Nazareth. But then on the scene comes John the Baptist, and we'll see, uh, we'll see him coming. Today's message is uh, the ambassador of Jesus, the ambassador of Jesus. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there 
uh, in your Bibles. I'd appreciate that. Luke chapter 3. And so we're picking up the story there. There are, there are other accounts of this. And I would encourage you to go read those accounts. They're found in Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8, and Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. Today we're going to be in Luke chapter 3. We kind of felt it was more of the full, rich account of, uh, of what we're going to read today. So I'll go ahead and pray, and uh, I will then go into the text. We'll read the text together, and then we'll break that apart. Let's pray. Father, what a great opportunity you've given us to look at your word today. And God, just to grow in our knowledge and faith of Jesus Christ. God, as we read the Word, it's not just about stories. It's not just about rules and regulations or requirements. God, it's, it's a book that guides us to the Messiah, the one that can bring life. So God, help us focus on Jesus today. Let, let's see him clearly as we go through the text, that he is our hope and he is the only hope. And that we would put our faith in him. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the stories of the Gospels are, are meant to increase our affections for Jesus. Uh, we're going to read verses uh, 1 through 18 in Luke chapter 3, if you want to follow along with me. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor in Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Itura, or Iturea, and uh, Trachonitis uh, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight the rough ways smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. Then he said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowds were asking him. He replied to them, The one who has two shirts must share with someone who has none, and the one who has food must do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what, what should we do? He told them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, don't take money from anyone or by force or false accusation and be satisfied with your wages. Now the people were waiting expectantly and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the strap of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing shovel is, at, is in his hand to clear the threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. What a rich passage of scripture and uh, a really neat turning point, kind of a tipping, uh, tipping point in, in Jerusalem's history, in Israel's history, in the, in the world's history, but certainly at that time. So there's a few things I want to cover uh, about the ambassador of Jesus today. Number one is this. The ambassador of Jesus came at the right time with the right message. You'll notice that the first part of chapter 3, there's a lot of names and places. Now, I'm going to read those again. Uh, but these names and places are actual historical people and, 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 and people that at one point uh, even thought, well, these, aren't, these don't exist. There's no evidence of them. And then Come to find out, they found a coin or found, found an inscription somewhere that showed this certainly was a person who was, who was tetriarch of so-and-so or of, of Abilene. So you see these people are historical facts and historical figures that, that place and date the appearance of Elijah. Now there's some of this that's a little bit um, uh, ambiguous because of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. So here it says, it says, In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, while Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetriarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Idorea uh, and Trachonitis, and then Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene. 
During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So th this first phrase, in the, uh, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, there's a lot of dating methods that could be used here. But, but all it does is slide the scale a little bit of, of the time frame. And usually it puts it right between, uh, I think I said, like 27 A.D., to about 30 AD, and really somewhat, they, they usually land about 29 AD is the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which if tw this is 29 AD, we think that Jesus was probably crucified around 33 AD. Uh, really shortly after this, Christ comes on the scene. He has about a three-year ministry. That dates that pretty perfectly. But aside from that, that which is really cool, and you can study that on your own, uh, there, there's the right time was not just that this historical time of all these people. It was, it was what was going on in the world. Rome had had Roman uh, the Roman Empire had a pinnacle, but they were kind of on a decline, especially in the, their beliefs and their just their society. Um, the world was heavily influenced by the Roman Empire, uh, but they'd been led to, to all types of pride, uh, pride uh, in, in human debauchery, like I can do whatever I want. So human debauchery, sensuality, uh, and pride that even led to atheism, like I can know everything that I can know, but there's nothing else beyond what I can know. And if I can't reason it, it doesn't exist. So they, they set aside theism in many ways. That was a, a type of pride. Um, and and while, while all religions were still tolerated, that, that pride formed because the religions of the day didn't seem to satisfy the deep needs at the times. Uh, slavery abounded, right? Uh, indescribable cruelty was everywhere. The sacredness of marriage and the family had disappeared. Uh, and then might, strength, was substituted in the place of right, and justice was nowhere to be found. This was the world that they lived in. There was utter despair, utter chaos. And really, as, as you think about that, and as I describe that, that is you and I today. So Jesus came at the right time because there was this deep need out of the, this dissatisfaction in the human heart. Now, today even, we see that all around. But people aren't ready and willing to admit that they're unsatisfied. They think their position satisfies them. They think they're their political stance satisfies them. They think that their, their voice satisfies them. They think that their pride, their ego, their accomplishments satisfy them. But it will end in despair without Jesus Christ. So that was the world of the day. That was that condition. But it was also religious conditions were ripe and ready. See, the religious conditions in and around Palestine were, were very low. Uh, there was much religion, but very little sincere religion. Uh, religion was all around. The, the external traditions and, uh, and all the regulations were multiplied and God's spirit and the transformation of the heart had been quenched. They overregulated every area and every detail of life until religion became this burden that was too heavy to carry. So many people abandoned religion because of that. This is too heavy. I can't do it. Even today we see that. We see uh, churches getting it wrong, going er erring too far on the side of legalism and and ritual and tradition rather than saying, what's the spirit of God up to? How do I find life in him? So when there's a religious system and it's legalistic, there's just a, a burden that people feel and they, they can't carry that load. It's too heavy. So there in the scripture, we see that uh, just at the right time, the phrase God's word came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And, and we see that phrase, God's word came. It, it's a formula for a prophetic message from God to be delivered to the nation of Israel, and not just the nation of Israel, right? This was God's messenger with God's message to God's people, but this message would go beyond just God's people. It was for the entire world, to anyone who would hear and repent and believe. Interestingly enough, instead of appearing in the king's court or in the city of Jerusalem or in the temple or the tabernacle, John appeared in the desert. He did not come to transform the established religion, right? He didn't come to say, listen, this is all wrong. Let's make, let's make some changes here. And uh, he didn't come to do that, but he came to separate the people from it and unto the Lord. He said, I'm going to call you out of that. I'm going to call you to something that, that you should have been called to before. I'm going to call you to faith in the Lord. So what, a, what an amazing thing. The ambassador of Jesus came at the right time with the right message. Number two is this, he proclaimed repentant, expectant faith. John proclaimed repentant, expectant faith. Uh, going on in our passage, uh, in verses three through six, he went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of the one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. 
Every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be made low. The crooked will become straight, the rough ways smooth, and everyone will see the salvation of God. He went into all the vicinity of the Jordan, it says. And Matthew's account tells us that he went into the desert of Judea. And all three synoptic gospels are quoting the same passage found in Isaiah chapter 40, where he goes to prepare a way. It says this in Isaiah 40, 3 through 5. A voice of one crying out, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make a straight highway for, the God, for God in the desert. Every valley will be lifted up and every mountain and every hill will be leveled. The uneven ground will become smooth and the rough places uh, a, a plain. And the glory of the Lord will appear and all humanity together will see it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Listen again, it must be understood that John came preaching in the desert. He came in the wasteland that was around Judea and Palestine, the, that area that where John was, was not in the synagogue. He was not in the king's court. And listen, John was a son of Zechariah. He was by birth a part of his tribe able to put on the priestly garments. He was able to be a priest and go that route, but he was, he was separated from birth for a different mission, a noble mission, not to be a priest, but to be a prophet. And he identified with the likes of Elijah. He had been set apart as God's messenger. Matthew's account tells us that he was the similarities of Elijah. John, in, in Matthew 3, 4, it says, John had camel hair garment, right? And a, length, a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. So it's so similar to this bold prophet Elijah. And we see this in 2 Kings. He had prophesied, Elijah had, about something in, in 2 Kings 1, 7 through 8. Uh, Elijah had prophesied and they came back to tell the king. And the king answered, what, what sort of man came, uh, came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? Because the words that were said before this were pretty impactful. He said, who, who was this? And he says, they, they replied, a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. He said, it's Elijah, the Tishbite. Elijah was a bold, bold prophet. And, and if you study Elijah, you'll see that not only the dress between Elijah and, uh, and John were, were the same, but they both isolated themselves from society and chose to fearlessly move toward it. So they would, they would be outside of society on the outskirts, but when it was time to give a word, they would go head in and say, listen, I, this is God's word. You need to repent and believe. So they would fearlessly move toward, towards it. They also share the same readiness to rebuke kings, right? Stand in king's courts and rebuke them or to rebuke the multitudes of people all around them. He reminded them that God was able to forgive and to give life. And, and he even said that, that he could make these stones become children of Abraham. If you thought you had any clout anywhere else, you could, you could find the fact that Jesus and, and God had the ability to make these stones cry out. The stones would give, have life. The lives of both prophets, they were a protest against the corruptions and, and the, uh, the, the, the things going on in society. They were, they were a protest against the religious systems. They, they heralded a wake-up call to the nations. And then he talks about this baptism of repentance. He says, he went into all the vicinity of the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Baptism literally means, the word means to dip under the water. Uh, it's used in the context of, of washing. It's used in the context of baptizing. It's used in the context of dyeing a garment. So you dip it in the water and make sure it gets the dye and it, it soaks it up. And it actually, it's kind of a neat thing with that word. Baptism is like that symbol of clean, cleansing and, um, and renewal or death to resurrection, but it's also the symbol of a change happening, right? So you think about a tapestry that's, that's a linen that, that goes into the dye, it changes and transforms it. It shows it as something new now. So kind of a neat relationship there with words. But the word and act symbolizes this changed identity or, or appearance and a change of relationships. Now the Jews of this day understood this as well. They, they ceremonially washed all the time. Uh, and to wash with water carried out the notion of cleansing or consecrating and setting apart, right? And having a new identity and a, and a, and a good relationship in, in place. But John called them to more than just confession and washing. He asked them to forsake their sin, to turn from their sin and say, that, let's not be this person anymore. And then turn to faith in God and then to walk in obedience to God and toward God and with God. And it said, for the forgiveness of sins. And this is what's interesting because I mentioned earlier, number two is that he's proclaiming a repentant, expectant faith. 
that, that John wanted people to know that there was someone coming, that something was coming, and something was coming that could bestow forgiveness of sins, like take care of all of the sin problem that you have. So this expectant faith, it, what John wasn't saying, listen, come and be baptized by me and I'll forgive all your sins. That's not what this meant. The Jews understood it was a washing, but uh, this was a forgiveness not offered by John, but through expectant faith in the one that was coming to forgive, in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, who could only forgive. So John's baptism symbolized this complete moral cleansing, right? This, this situational saying, I, I'm no longer this person. I no longer want to be in sin. I want to walk in obedience to God. So it was this, that was a sim, uh, symbolism of it. But it was a public confession of sin, and it was a public confession of people's need for the Savior. It was essentially a symbol that set people apart from their old way of life and, and belief, and they proclaimed a readiness. This is that expectant faith. This is the, where the forgiveness of sins picks up. Uh, people's, people were proclaiming a readiness to receive God's salvation and forgiveness through the coming Messiah. So while, while cleansing used to be more of a penitent thing, they would, they would go and confess their sins and get right with God and go about their business, and they'd come back and do it often. What we're seeing here is this expectant that no longer is this confession uh, needed now. I'm going to be able to go confess, uh, repent, confess, and, and be clean totally by the saving grace and work of Jesus Christ. And that's, that's wholly what Christ does for us. We, we no longer go into confessional. We no longer sacrifice animals over and over. Jesus was the once and for all perfect lamb sacrifice for us. So John's baptism that he's, he's doing here is an expectant baptism of what is to come. Now today, baptism is very similar to what we see practiced by John. Right? Uh, although it is, it's a celebration now and a symbol uh, of, of a changed and forgiven heart. So today we celebrate the changed and forgiven heart, while John uh, was, was more expectant of the changed and forgiven heart. So baptism today is not expectant as it was then. Baptism today is celebratory. And, and I want us to, uh, just to pause for a second and think about this. Uh, next week, and, and I, I've mentioned this in our, our uh, announcements in the weeks past, we are still meeting outside. It's, it's awesome out there. It's fresh and it's wonderful. There's lots of space out there. Uh, we have a great time every Sunday uh, over in the cemetery, right? The south, southwest corner of the cemetery. Uh, we have pop-ups there. Bring your chair. It's, a, it's an awesome time. Next week, uh, we are, God, Lord willing, going to meet out there again. We're meeting at 1030. Uh, we are celebrating in baptism. So uh, I'm so excited about that. I'm, I'm just so excited to do it outside and, and have that, just that opportunity to see God is still working in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, people, people are coming to profess faith in Christ, to celebrate what God has done in their hearts. Now, if you would like to be baptized, what a great opportunity to do that. We're going to be doing that next week. And if, if you want to, please contact us. Let us know. Uh, call the church office. Email me. Let me know. Uh, love, to, love to visit with you and, and make sure you understand what that's all about. But baptism is something that comes after salvation. For you and I, it's that we have put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then we go, we go into the water and say, I'm going to show everybody how Jesus has cleansed me of my sin, through my, how my faith in Christ has changed me uh, from the inside out, that I'm no longer an old person, I'm the new person. What an awesome proclamation. And that's what John is doing here. The, the ambassador of Jesus is proclaiming a repentant, expectant faith that, listen, listen, everybody, stop, stop checking off your list. Stop trying to live on your own. There's only despair that's going on here. Come to faith in Christ. Expect what he's going to do. Turn from your sin. Come, be ready to follow uh, and, and be a part of his kingdom. And then we go to number three. Number three, the ambassador of Jesus explained repentant, expectant faith. So he, he, he said, listen, repentant, expectant faith is come be set apart, be baptized, and, and that's, that's part of your expectant faith. Uh, but, but more than that, it was, it was what changes? What's new now? What's different? Because God is always wanting to look at the heart. So we pick it up here uh, in Luke chapter 3 and verse 7 through 14. He said to the crowds who came out to be baptized, brood of vipers, you, uh, who warned you to flee the coming wrath? Therefore, produce fruit consistent uh, with repentance. And don't start saying to yourselves, oh, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What then should we do? The crowds asked him. He replied, the one who has two shirts, share with someone who has none. And the one who has food must do the same. 
Tax collectors also came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He said to them, Don't collect any more than what you have been authorized. Some soldiers also questioned him, What should we do? He said to them, Don't take money from anyone by force or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. Now, listen, this is, this is the explanation of what's going on. He's already proclaimed this repentant, uh, expectant faith. Now he's explaining what this looks like. What does repentant, expectant faith look like? And he says to the crowds that came, it's interesting, there's kind of divided into two groups of people, there, and you'll see the other accounts. But there's religious leaders, the self-righteous, the ones who already believe that they're children of Abraham and that they've already been accepted into God's kingdom. So why do we need this? What, what should we be doing? And then the other crowd is the ones that maybe are in despair. They're the broken. They're the, they're the, the soldiers and the tax collectors. They're the sinners that come up wanting something. There are people who have the heavy burden and load of, of uh, religion on their shoulders. And they just, they just want to get free. They want to know, what, what do we do? What happens here? So they're divided into two. And again, those religious leaders were one that they thought by virtue, by, by mere virtue of me being who I am, of being born into this family, into this tribe, I'm good. I'm already great. And, and, but he says, you're a brood of vipers. You're a sack of snakes. And, and when you let go and slither wherever you and snakes were unclean. And whatever you touch is now unclean. He called them out. He said, there's, there's hypocrisy there. Uh, and you need to change. You, you spread defilement to everyone you touch. He reminded them that God was able to give life, right? Again, like I said earlier, to these stones and make them children of Abraham. That, that people just because of their birth were not considered children of Abraham. People were considered children of Abraham and a part of God's kingdom by faith in the Messiah. And that's what was not happening. And, there was, and, and if they could even say, well, I, I believe. Well, show us that. And that's what John was saying. Show us. You know, the other group here were the outcasts. I mentioned that. They were hungry for God's message and they genuinely wanted to know what was required of them. But listen, the answer for either group is the same. It's show your repentance through the fruit that you produce from the heart. And it's just like it is today. It's the same answer today. What does repentance look like? It looks like stopping doing what you were doing. Set aside your pride. Set aside your position. Set aside whatever sin you want to bring along to Jesus. Say, no, I'm forsaking that. I'm pushing that aside. And I am moving towards obedience. I'm going to walk in obedience, in, in fruit. And that's what Jesus wants from us. He wants it from the heart. It's, it's whether you're today, you're maybe the self-righteous religious person saying, listen, I've got it all together. I've gone to church. I was born in the church. I'm probably on the third pew. It doesn't matter if you're a religious self-righteous person today, or if you're an outcast, repentance is the requirement for acceptance into the kingdom of God. We have to turn from our own ego, turn from our own self, abandon it and run to Jesus. There's a lot of prophecy that talks about this. Isaiah says this in Isaiah 29, 13. The Lord said, These people approach me with their speeches and they honor me with lip service, yet their hearts are far from me. And human rules direct their worship of me. He said it's a heart issue. You, you, you might think you're doing good. You might speak this, or talk the talk and pretend to walk the walk, but your heart is so far from me. You're just checking off the list, the boxes. And in Psalm 24, and actually we left off this year in our series in Psalm 23, so next summer we'll start with a psalm. But Psalm 24, 3 through 6 says this, Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false, and who has not sworn, or not sworn deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who inquire of him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. There's such a deep need for us to come to God with a pure heart, to seek him from, from a, a heart that says, I want to do whatever he wants me to do. Isaiah confronted this also. Uh, God through Isaiah confronted this in Isaiah 58. The people asked, because they've been confronted by God, they asked, God, why have we fasted? But you haven't seen. Like, hey, we've been up to the good things. We've been checking off the boxes. Why have we fasted, but you haven't seen? Why have we denied ourselves, but you haven't noticed? Look, you do as you please on the day of your fast, and you oppress all your workers. This is the response. You fast with contention and strife and strike viciously with your fist. 
You cannot fast as you do today, hoping to make your voice heard on high. Will the fast I choose be like this? A day for a person to deny himself, uh, to bow his head like a reed, and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? He's challenging, he's challenging the status quo. He's saying that's, that mere outward, ex, outward expression is not, uh, not what I'm looking for. So he says, will you, will you do it this way and call this acceptable to the Lord? Isn't this the fast I choose? So here's what God says. This is the fast that I choose. This is how I want you to prove your loyalty and devotion from the heart. To break the chains of the wicked. To untie uh, the ropes of the yoke. He goes on, he says in verse, uh, verse 6, to set the oppressed free and to tear off every yoke. It is not to share, or is it not to share your bread with the hungry, to bring the poor and homeless into your house, to clothe the naked when you see him, and to not ignore your own flesh and blood. Then your light will appear like the dawn, and your recovery will come quickly. Your righteousness will go before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. See, a, a true, honest fast, a true, honest uh, fruit that's, that's consistent with repentance is hum humbly serving those around you, considering other, others' needs as more important than your own, taking care to serve and love people, and serve and love people toward Jesus, toward the saving faith in Jesus Christ. That's what God is requiring of us, and that's what's being proclaimed He's proclaiming repentant, expectant faith, and he's explaining repentant, uh, ex expectant, repentant faith. And he's saying that it produces a fruit. It does something. Finally, number four, the ambassador of Jesus, he pointed to the Messiah that transforms. He pointed to the Messiah that transforms. Again, I, I, I got to tell you, this is not just about some feel-good ways to live and some ways to check off the boxes and, and say, I, I've done it, I, I, I've I've accomplished what God wanted me to accomplish. I've been the person he wanted me to, to be. It, it, you can't do that. At the same time, discount the only life that's found in Jesus Christ. When we set aside Jesus, we have absolutely nothing. So here's what was happening. If we go on in our text in Luke 3, starting at verse 15, there's this message going out of expectant, repentant faith and, and, and being told that there's fruit to be produced here. So John's preaching this, and, and the people are starting to wonder because this is very messianic. This, this sounds deeply messianic. So here, here's the text. It says, now the people were waiting expectantly. Like, okay, we've heard from you. Now what? what what's going to happen? Something, something special is going on. Now the people were waiting expectantly, and all of them were questioning in their hearts whether John might be the Messiah. So John answered them all. I, I baptize you with water. But the one who is more powerful than I am is coming. I am not worthy to untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing shovel is at it in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with fire that never goes out. Then, along with many other exhortations, he proclaimed good news to the people. Listen, as we talk about this series, as we go into the Gospels, as we harmonize the scriptures of the Gospel text, it's all about Jesus. Right? This, this sermon today isn't about John the Baptist. It's about John the Baptist who points to Jesus, the Messiah. And when people start thinking, are you the Messiah? Are you the one they promised? He's like, oh, oh no. No, no. He is. And we'll see that in the coming weeks where, where the, he shows off. Here's Jesus. Jesus comes and sees him. He says, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, an amazing, amazing uh, imagery there that, that John is saying, listen, that's Jesus. I don't want you to, I'm not pointing you to myself. I'm just calling you to repent and have this expectant faith in the one that's to come. And by the way, it's not me. He's, he's on his way though. He's going to be a real, real soon. So the people around John, they were coming for baptism. They, they knew the message was messianic, and he, he clears it up. He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. Uh, what I'm doing, I'm performing an, a symbol or a sign that's an external sign, right? It, it's an external sign of what should be going on internally, a baptism. But I, I'm only doing this external baptism. The one that's coming is the only one that can do something that's internal. It is an internal sign. He says the Messiah will give a new sign to God's people. 
And that new sign will be the Holy Spirit as a gift to all of those who are part of his kingdom, who, who have expressed repentant faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus, our Messiah, was the only one who could baptize us with the Holy Spirit and the only one who could come in authority as the perfect judge as well. When he talks about being baptized uh, with the Holy Spirit and with fire, he's saying, listen, God, God has this authority all, all over Jesus. And when Jesus comes as God in the flesh, he is not only going to gift us with the Holy Spirit, he is also the one to whom we must stand and give an account. And he will be our judge. So he comes ready to, to uh, go on the threshing floor and with, with his winnowing, winnowing shovel. And he, he gets the, the wheat and stores it, the good wheat, part of his kingdom, right? And, and the chaff, all the religious elite, all the people who said, oh, I don't need him. I just, I'll just check the boxes off or I, I don't need anything to do with God. There will be judgment for them. And he has authority for that. And that needs to be understood and said. He didn't just come to address the external, but he came to change what was on the inside. Jesus changes hearts. He doesn't want to just shape you up. He wants to change your heart. And the work that he came to do was a work that could not be duplicated by any human being. The work Jesus came to do and accomplish was a work that could not be duplicated by any other human being. This was God in the flesh, folks. This was God in the flesh who came to bring life and life was only found in him. Not only does he come baptizing with the Holy Spirit, but with fire. We need to understand there is the judgment of God in play. When Jesus comes to rule, he will remove all that is worthless, useless, lifeless. He will accept into his kingdom only what has life, and that life has to be received through faith in Jesus Christ alone. It was the right time for this this crowd of people, for this hurting, desperate people, they needed a Savior. And listen, today, that Savior is needed just as much, if not more. We all need the Savior. You may have friends that need the Savior. You may have family that need the Savior. You may not even know people that need the Savior. I bet you do. Go find them. Tell them about Jesus Christ. Because life is only found in Him. I found a really neat paragraph of, of commentary as I was studying for this. And I, I just want to read that to close us out. So the growth of Jesus was not hurried and forced, but slow and natural. For more than 30 years, he tarried at Nazareth, waiting until his strength had matured and his manhood was complete. Then his hour was struck in tones audible to himself and his people. The tongue that told it came from the banks of the Jordan uh, and the waste places about the Dead Sea. There, a new prophet had appeared, ancient in manners and spirit, modern in speech and purpose. No sleek scribe, no uh, pomp pompous priest. He was a son of, a, of the desert, clad in garments of coarse camel's hair, bound round him uh, by the leather girdle, see, uh, seeking his food from the rock where, where the wild bee left its honey and the locust came. A man full of a stern spirit of solitude and the thoughts God speaks to the soul that dares to be alone. He calls himself a voice, but he was not like the still small voice of the, uh, the prophet had heard in his mountain cave. He was rather like the wind and the fire that broke into pieces on the rocks. Heralds as they were of the low, sweet voice that, that was to come out of the silence they left. People from the banks of the Jordan crowded to hear him. His fame reached Jerusalem. The Sadducees and Pharisees, scribes and priests, publicans and sinners, went forth to listen and to be awed into a passing reverence of faith. West and east, south and north, the tidings spread, reached remote Nazareth, and woke great emotions in the home of the carpenter there. He who had become, since Joseph was not, the head and breadwinner of the little family, knew that his hour was come. And he went forth, the son of Joseph, to return the Messiah of God. What a wonderful start to this ministry we see of Jesus Christ. But even the ministry as it started was not about John as much as it was about the Messiah that was to come. And I, and I want to revert back to the very first verse that, that our theme is centered around. 
John 20, 31. These gospel accounts, these stories, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And I hope you do. God bless you guys. I love you so much. Let me pray for you, and you guys can get into some discussions or enjoy the rest of your day. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. We count it a joy and a privilege to know Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And Father, if there are some that are listening today that do not know him, God, I pray that you would, you would see that all of Scripture points to him and the work that the Messiah can, the work the Messiah does externally and internally is no work that can be duplicated by any man or woman on earth. It is only by divine providence, divine power. God, help us to, to show faith, repentant, expectant faith in the Messiah, and then celebratory faith, uh, following him in obedience, bearing fruit, whether that's, that's being baptized or, or producing a fruit of humility and servitude to those around us. God, may, may our lives, may the fruit that is produced from your spirit, point people directly to the Messiah. And we pray in his precious name. Amen. God bless you guys.